He doesn't want anything other than you or from you, other than all of you. The good, the bad, the ugly. He wants you, your heart. He wants you to fall in love with him today. How wonderful is that? Keep your wallet in your back pocket. It's okay. That's not what he needs. He's got all the cattle on the hill. He owns everything. It's his. He don't need your money. He wants you right now where you're at. So just let go, man. All, all the whispers in the ears, all the thoughts that we, we, we hear, all the things that, that go in our lives, just drop them right now in the name of Jesus. Yeah. These things are nothing but chains that are trying to hold you back from falling and madly in love with God. Just drop them and say in the name of Jesus. Watch what we're doing right now. Thank you. 
So as we're singing that break of the chain, I hear all these words. I hear all these words in my heart. I hear, I hear indifference. Break the chain of indifference. Break the chain of lukewarm. Amen? Let's break the 
<laughs> Praise you, Jesus. I feel like getting undignified before the Lord and dance before him like David did because he's just given us the victory. Yes, hallelujah. Come on, high five your neighbor. You just have victory. Yeah, yeah. You may not understand it, but that's okay because it's finished. Amen. Uh -huh. Oh, 
children gathered here this morning. A little dirty, a little beat up, a little afraid, confused. But heck, we're just children. We gather here to meet with our daddy this morning, knowing that everything is better when we're in your presence. The moment that you walk into the room, everything changes. That's the power of our daddy. There's no more nightmares and no more fears. There's no more depression. No more lack in our self-esteem because you call us your children. And we find who we are in you. There is no more lack because it is you who provides for your kids. And you promise to meet us in our daily needs. There is no more hopelessness because you are our shepherd. And in you we will have no wants. But in you we find the greatest of all hopes. That you have plans for us, not to harm us, but to prosper us, a plan for a future. That you look down on us. And your arm is not too short to see. But you hold us in the palm of your hands and nothing Nothing that this big bad world can throw at us can ever remove us or separate us from your love. Nothing can pluck us out of your hand because you are that strong, you're that big, you're our daddy. You're the apple of your eye. Your word says. You tell us that every thought you have towards us is, is love. And that you literally sing songs of us as you hold us in your arms. That you speak life into us. That we gather here to meet with you and know you. In the name of Jesus, this is your time. Have your way with us. We come, Lord, our hearts are like fertile souls. So speak your word into us today, man. Only your words. No words of men or women, but just yours. Because your words bring healing. Your words bring hope. Your words bring restoration. Your words bring relief. Your words are promises that end in yes and amen. Your words are alive. They mend and they heal. 
They cut us to the very marrow of our bones, revealing the things that need to be revealed so that we can lay them at the cross and say it is done. And I deny myself, I will pick up my cross and I will follow Jesus. And you look down upon us and say, this is my son and my daughter who I am well pleased. That we have the same inheritance that you promised Jesus Christ. That we are adopted into your family. We are the bride of your son. And you're coming back for an awesome celebration. You haven't forgotten us here, but you're preparing a place for us right now as we speak. A place beyond our wildest dreams. And while we are here, we are to share that hope, that message, that good news of Jesus until the day you come back and you bring us home for the wedding. So Father, we come when our hearts are full of so to speak. Your word may grow deep roots this morning. May we, may we leave this place changed forever from the inside out, not because of fancy words or great music, but because of your power and your name. Hmm. Because of your words, we will be changed. Because your word will never return empty or void. So speak your words, Lord. Have your way among us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I gotta tell you, um, today's message is just an intro for next week. Sorry. Um, I'm not good with series. As my wife says, I suffer from imitative ADHD or something. Oh, no. <laughs> After she started talking, I wasn't paying attention. But <laughs> so I'm not really good with series because, like, you know, tomorrow I'm sure I'll do something new. It seems like fun. But God's really put something in my heart that I really believe that we need to take our time and study and look at this. And this whole topic and subject of counterfeit gods. So I want to start this morning, and I know it sounds crazy, but I want to talk about us and why it's so important that we understand. Father, as we open your word this morning, teach us, reveal to us, Holy Spirit, show us the secrets of God himself and remind us of the things that, that he has told us. Reveal the scriptures to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So to start, before we talk about counterfeit gods, I need to talk about us. I need to answer a question through scripture this morning. Many of us... We don't even know why we're here. We don't know why we were created. I want to look at Colossians 1.16. Colossians 1.16. Let's start with verse 16. It says, For through him God created everything. In the heavenly realms, on earth, he made the things we can see and the things that we cannot see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities, and the unseen world. Listen to what he says. God says, everything was created through him and for him. We were created by God for God. That's why we were created. Now Isaiah 43, 7 says, God says, bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. Genesis 1, 27 says, God said, in our image, I will create man and woman. Why were we created in the image of God? So that we can have such an intimate relationship with God. It's not, I mean, everybody laughs. I mean, I, I appreciate all the pictures you guys post on my Facebook wall of the German shepherds in it because you know that I'm obsessed with my German shepherd. As, as much as I love Zeus and, and I know that he loves me and we cuddle in bed and my wife says it's gross, doesn't matter, she won't get it, but... And, I mean, I take showers and he stares at me, and uh, that's a little weird, I guess. But <laughs> now that I think about it, I didn't. didn't. <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm just thinking, nobody said go fetch. You know? But anyway, um, sorry. We'll delete that from the Thank you. Sorry. Anyway, all right, folks. See? He makes me think, man. It's fun. I don't ever want to change. I love the world I live in. But anyway, um,. I, yeah, I'm obsessed with my dog. My dog, he loves me. I'm his favorite. But we'll never have an intimate relationship because he's a dog and I'm a guy. You know, I just, you know, we can be best buds, but that's as far as ever it goes. And when God said in Genesis 1, 27, he said, let's be a man and women in our image. The reason why he said that is because he wanted us to be like him. 
in the sense that we would have such a relationship. We wouldn't be scared of him. We would get to know him. We wouldn't be fearful of him. When God sent Jesus, his son, to this world, the reason why he didn't send him as a doll or an ant or a bug is because we would never have understood or related to Jesus. He sent Jesus in the same form as a man, as just like us, all man and all God, so that way we could see him, relate, understand, have conversation with him. So we were created by God for God. We were created, our hearts were made in such a way that we were born to worship. We were. We were born to worship. We were born to praise God. That's why we're here. And it's not that he's a megalomaniac. Listen, God is awesome. God is almighty. God is fantastic. He's phenomenal. He is the great I am with or without us. Creating us didn't make God better. It didn't exalt him to a higher level. He did it because he wants to love us. He wants to be loved back. That's why we were given free will. He wants us to fall in love with him. He wants us to choose him. And we were created, I'm going to give you a seat for a second, Tim. We were created with a throne inside of our heart. And nothing can fill that void. Nothing can take that place. Nothing can sit on this throne except God Almighty, period. That's the way he made us. Then comes Satan, Lucifer, shining bright star. And he takes Adam and Eve and he leads them astray. And all of a sudden, God is off of this throne and, and man is put on this throne. And we begin to worship ourselves. We begin to serve ourselves. And, and the way that we were created in the garden, it was God and us. And because of the fall of man, because of Adam's sin, we now have counterfeit gods in this world. And every one of us has them. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at three specific counterfeit gods or three categories. The first one I want to talk about, and listen, let me back up. It doesn't matter, by the way, whether or not you believe in God. God exists. He doesn't exist because of your belief or not. Your own belief. God exists. God made you, regardless of what you think, and you were made to worship Him. And every one of us, you can come in here today and you tell me that you're an atheist or that you don't believe in anything, no higher power or nothing, but the bottom line is every one of us has a God or gods in our life that we worship. All of us do. Every one of us. And it doesn't matter what you think when you say we all have gods. Everyone believes in one because we were made to worship. Now you may not believe in the God of the Bible or God of the Gospels, but that's because you're worshiping a counterfeit God, but it's important to understand that counterfeit gods, hmm, they have no power and they have no authority until we put them on the throne. And I want to look at three areas that we're going to look at in the next couple of weeks. The three types of counterfeit gods that we're going to expose. We're going to identify, we're going to expose, and then we're going to destroy them. The first one is this. The first one is personal counterfeit gods. You know, three type of personal account for God, so we're going to get into the first one is, believe it or not, I know this sounds crazy. Can we all agree that we are saved by grace? Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. The Bible says that God sent Jesus to die for our sins while we were still sinners. While we were God's very enemies, he loved us and cared for us so much that he sent his son to die for us. There is no other way, Jesus says. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man will enter heaven. No one will see God except through Jesus Christ. And it's for grace, or for by grace that we have been saved through faith, not works. Why? So none of us can boast, Paul says. So we were saved by grace. However, there are counterfeit gods out there that still tell us that our doctrine, for example, I've had a church down the street tell me that I'm going to hell because I pray in tongues. I had another church tell me before that I wasn't going to heaven because I didn't pray in tongues. See, we, we, we make counterfeit gods out of our doctrine, our beliefs, and we need to get back to just what God says and get rid of all this stuff. So we're going to explore and go through that. We have other things that we lift up. We lift up money. 
We lift up our families. We lift up our spouses. We lift up our careers. All these things have become counter for God's. Our morality has become a counter for God. In other words, we say that because I read my Bible, because I pray, because I actually stand up in a worship and wave my hand, because I even take notes during the sermon, man, I know God loves me. And God doesn't love you because you stand up and raise your hand. God doesn't love you because you take notes. God doesn't love you because you're reading and praying. God loves you because he made you and he loves you, period. This love is not based upon what you can do, but that's called legalism. Right? I do these laws and I get love, and, and that's not how we approach God. See, all these things are, are counterfeit gods that I, I just see the body, and we just need to get rid of all this stuff and fall back in love with God Almighty, period. We need to identify over the next three weeks, we're going to identify these counterfeit gods. We're going to expose them in our very own lives, confess them out loud, and then, like Paul, when he went into Athens, He's going to say, no, these, these, these gods are not gods. This is God, God Almighty. So we're going to identify, we're going to expose, and we're going to destroy these counterfeit gods. Call our culture and counterfeit gods. We worship politics. Hillary, she'll fix everything. Trump will fix everything. Ruby, or whatever you... Really? You put your faith in a man or woman? I'm not going to fix anything, man. We put ourselves, our own feelings for ourselves are counterfeit gods. My feelings matter. I have a voice. What I think is important. Jesus said, deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. I want to start with just something simple this morning. I want to keep it short because I want you to go home in this week and I want you to think about this. I want you to pray over this and I want you to just base in this in a slow cooker. Don't microwave it. And I want you to think about something. Every one of us, every one of us has a counter for God. All of us, look around. You know what I I haven't said? We all have counterfeit gods in our life. And this week, I just want you to think over this. Because we need to, before we can expose them, before we can destroy them, we need to identify them. So I want to help you this morning identify your counterfeit gods. So that over the next couple of weeks, we can stomp these things out so they'll never come back. We laugh at the Israelites when they were leaving ex or when they were during the Exodus when they were leaving Egypt and they were wandering in the wilderness and, and it wasn't just just weeks after that God performed all these miraculous signs. All these wonderful well, wonderful for the Israelites, bad for the Egyptians, but all these miraculous plagues and signs, all these wonders, splitting the Red Sea, all these things, and, and we laugh at the Israelites because it wasn't just a short moment later that you know, Moses comes down from the mountaintop and they're worshiping a golden calf, and we laugh at them. Oh, how stupid the Israelites were, right? That's, that's what we say, because we're American, we're smarter than that. Yeah. Um, oh, how could they do that? Oh, they're such adulterous people. And, and the question is, I want to ask you this morning, very, very simple. Who is sitting on your throne? Who is sitting on your throne this morning? And let's help identify if it's God or a counterfeit God. Number one, who do you chase after? Or what do you chase after? So you don't feel alone. Who or what do you chase after so you don't feel alone? Number two, what do you hold on to for security? I'm 41 years old and I still put a sheet over myself when I sleep because that just makes me feel secure and like that's going to stop the big bad robbers. But but I'm serious. What do you hold on to, or who do you hold on to for security? What makes you feel safe? What occupies 
your dreams at night in your thoughts during the day. What are you dreaming about at night? What are you thinking about during the day? And what consumes most of your time during the day? For me, right away, TV. I can veg for hours. I don't want to read for five minutes, right? I can watch reruns of sitcoms, but I don't want to sit and pray. Ah, that's just me. I'm just being honest with you. What consumes most of the time during your day? Finally, I want to ask you this. You ready? What is the one thing that you hold on to? What is the one thing that you cherish and that you love that if it was taken away from you would cause you or put you in such despair or such a place of depression that you don't know if you could go on or down? What is that? What, if something was taken out of your life, what would make you fall to your knees and say, I give up? That's your counter for God. Because that's what you're putting on the throne and expecting to provide for you like God was, is supposed to provide. You're expecting that thing to give you security like God is supposed to give you security. You're expecting that thing to identify you. I mean, one of the big things that we have for counterfeit gods is romance. Romance. I, I don't mean romance is bad, but, but we fall in love and, and, and we look towards a relationship to identify who we are. We look to a person to lift us up. We look for, into a person to say who we are. We look at a person for our happiness. I love my wife. I'm not saying that because she just walked in. You can say, I know, she's standing right here. Now she's married to me. I love my wife. She is my best friend. I, honestly, I'd rather hang out with her even more than Zeus. She doesn't believe it, but I'd rather hang out with her more than anyone. However, it is wrong for me to look at my wife and expect her to fill the void inside of me. It's wrong for me to look at my wife and expect her to tell me who I am. Expect her to bring security into my relationship or into me. It's wrong for me to expect her to do any of these things. Those are false, unattainable expectations that I am placing on my spouse. That's God's job. She's the benefit of me falling in love with God. She's a blessing from loving God. She's just a bonus point. Ding, ding, ding. I win because I'm in love with God. She is not my God. Stop putting her on this, this, this throne and expecting things from our spouses. But that's what we do when we get into a relationship and we break up and we're going, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to go on? Well, they were never meant to be on the throne in the first place. That's why God says, I'll love you, and I'll never leave you, and I'll never turn my back on you. He's the only one that's ever made that promise. The rest of us, brothers and sisters, we're human. We're sinners that need a Savior. Don't put unattainable expectations. See, these are so many counterfeit gods that I want to go over the next couple weeks. But every one of us has a counterfeit God. And throughout history, let me, let me go to this one. Throughout history, we look at civilizations that have actually sacrificed their children to counterfeit. Right? The Aztecs. I remember when we were in Mexico and, and we were on this cruise, my wife and I, and all I wanted to do is, is somebody laugh? It's not funny. Laura, is that you back there? Are you laughing because I was in Mexico? Oh, all right. Was that, was that sneeze? God bless you. I don't know how old I was, but all right. So I was a new squirrel. Maybe you should. I was in Mexico, my wife, and you know, those tempers and the Mayan ruins. I'm like, man, that's all I want to do is see this Mayan ruin. And it's funny, because I wanted to see the place where they would cut them up, you know, the heads off and roll them down the steps. And, you know, and, and, and the Mayans and the Aztecs, these different civilizations, all throughout history, used to sacrifice their children to their counterfeit gods. And when we look at them and we think, how asinine is that? How stupid? That doesn't make sense to us. Yet, how many of us sacrifice our children for our careers? To count for God, that we're actually giving up our children for that count for God. Yeah, but I'm supposed to be a good provider. Man, and God's going to provide through me to you, not your career. How many of us sacrifice our children 
for our own selfish desires. I mean, I can think of, I, I, I hear the voices, Daddy, come play with me. No, I'm busy. I'm not really busy. I just don't want to play with you. You know, let's be honest. Well, I'm not the only one. <laughs> it's like somebody's down on the bike. How many of us sacrifice the relationship with our spouse because we'd rather do something else? I mean, man, when was the last time you took the time to cry? When was the last time you took your wife on a date? No, not McDonald's. Don't you? Know. <laughs> <laughs> anything off the dollar meal. We don't get out of here. <laughs> but, the, but it's true. We sacrifice all kinds of people that we love to these false counterfeit gods. And this is what we're going to go over. But I want to I give you this morning as we end. And I want to challenge you this week. I want you to read this book. This is only like 14 chapters. Now. And it's the book of Hosea. See, I want to tell you about this prophet Hosea. He was the prophet to the nation of Israel. And you think your job stinks. When God called Hosea to be a prophet to the nation of Israel, you know what he told him? The first thing he told him, he said, I want you to go marry a prostitute, a promiscuous woman. Think about that for a moment. Hey, God, here I am. I want to be a, a pastor, a preacher, a teacher, an evangelist, a apostle. I want to do it. I want to work for you, God. I pray I got something special for you. Go marry a whore. What? That, but that's what he said. Don't believe you see, read it this week. Don't just take my word for it. He tells, and he says, and, and here's the one. I want you to marry this girl named Gomer. What a name. <laughs> Could you imagine carving that on the tree? Donnie and Gomer forever. Oh, no way. You know, like, not only is he a cheat, she's, she's a prostitute, and her name is Gomer. Like, it just isn't a lose lose. Like, you know, I mean, and, Sorry if anyone here is kids named Gomer. <laughs> <laughs> it's the old way now here. Anyway, we um, no, um. And so Hosea goes and he marries Gomer, the promiscuous woman, and she bears him two boys and a girl. And after she has the three children, you know what she does? She does what she was supposed to do. She goes out and starts prostituting, cheating on Hosea. And his heart breaks. And then God says, okay, tell her to come back. Tell her to wipe off the, he calls it the prostitute makeup, and, and take off the clothes that reveal her breasts. And, and tell her to get dignified, wash herself up, and I want you to take her back. Ouch. But God, under the law that you wrote, under the law that you gave Moses, if a woman is caught committing adultery, she's to be put to death. That's the law. But God tells Hosea, no, I know the law, I wrote it, but I want you to take her back. And this happens over and over again. He takes her back, she cheats on him. He takes her back, and she te cheats on him. I want to read something from Hosea 4. Listen to, just listen to God's heart. Isaiah 4, starting in verse 1, he says, There is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. You make vows and you break them. You kill and steal and commit adultery. There is violence everywhere, murder after another. And that is why your land is mourning and everyone is wasting away. Even the wild animals, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea are disappearing. And he says, don't put your fingers at someone else and don't try to pass the, pass the, pass the blame. My complaint is with you. See, every one of us, we have to honest this morning. Every one of us has a false or accounted for God in our lives. And we need to get rid of these things. 
We need to stop being like Gomer and cheating on Hosea. Because that's exactly why God had Hosea marry her. He said, I want you to know what it feels like when someone commits adultery. If you're going to be my prophets to the people, I want you to feel what I feel, God said. And see, at one time, most of us have confessed our love and our faith in God. God, you're on the throne. Nobody else. We love you. We're, we're dying to ourselves. We'll give you everything. And, and God calls it lip service because he really doesn't sit on the throne. We put counterfeit gods up there. And by law, the wages of sin, the penalty of that adultery, by law, we should all be put to death because of that. Because that we cheated on God, his law, his book says that, that we, are, we have a death sentence because of that. He goes on in Hosea 11, he said, when, I, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called him my son and my daughter, and I called them out of Egypt, but the more that I called to them, the further that they moved from me, offering sacrifices to images of a false god and burning incense and idols to them. I myself, I taught Israel how to walk, leading them along the land by their hand. But he doesn't know or even care. And that is why I who took care of him. My heart is breaking. I led Israel along. With the ropes of kindness, I love and love. I lifted the yoke from his neck. I myself, I stooped down, God says, I stooped down to feed them. But my people were determined to desert me. They call me, listen, they call me the most high, but they don't truly honor me. Listen to what he says. See, he knows the penalty for that adultery. And God says, Hosea 11, verse 8, my heart is torn within me and my compassion overflows. What is God supposed to do? The law requires blood because we committed adultery. We turned our backs on God. We have counterfeit gods in our life and the law. See, God is a just God. In other words, God, he has to practice justice. Whether or not we like it, he is a just God, and it is impossible for him to go against the laws that he spoke or had Moses written. He can't do it. And the law says that the wages of sin, when we commit adultery against God, it is death. Blood has to be spilled. That's what the law. So God is, is talking to Hosea, and he goes, man, my heart is torn. Because I love him. I absolutely love him. I made them. I created them. I knit them together in my mother's womb. My heart pours out for them. I, I love them. I made them for me. I created them for me to worship me, to praise, to, just to bask in my presence. But they keep deserting me and turning their back on me, and they have these counterfeit gods. And, and I know what the law says, and they have to be destroyed. I don't want to destroy them. So what am I supposed to do? Hosea 13 and 14, he says, I have been the Lord of the Lord your God ever since I brought you out of Egypt. You must acknowledge no other God but me, because there is no other Savior. So God says this, he says in verse 4, chapter 14, he says, Return to the Lord your God, for your sins have brought you down. Bring your confessions and return to the Lord. Say to him, Forgive all of our sins and graciously receive us so that we may offer you our praises. And when we confess to God, when we, re, when we identify, when we expose, and we destroy these counterfeit odds, when we confess these things to God, listen to what God says. He says, the Lord says in verse 4, that I will heal you of all your faithlessness. My love will know no bounds, for my anger will be gone Forever. I will be to Israel, or I will be to you, he says, like a refreshing dew from heaven. I am the tree that is always green. All of your fruit comes from me. O Israel, just stay away from the idols. I am the one 
He answers your prayers and care for you. A lot of us, Daniel, bang on that wall. Thanks. I didn't do it. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel Franklin. Oh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny. Right? See? Sorry. Didn't work in the crib. You all have ADHD, just like me. Just in a happy place here. Um, Alright, focus. Worship team to come up. I want to close with a statement soon. He says, they are a shameless prostitute, and they became pregnant in a shameful way. She said, I will run after other lovers, this is Hosea 2, and I will sell myself to them. I will have counterfeit gods for water, for food, for clothing of wool and fine linens, and for olive oil and for drinks. But God says, for this reason, I will fence her in with thorn bushes. I will block her path with a wall to make her lose her way. And when she runs after her lovers, she won't be able to catch them. And she, she will search for them, but not find them. Then she will think, I might as well return to my husband, for I was better off with him than I am now. She doesn't realize it was I who gave her everything she has. The grain, the new wine, the olive oil. I even gave her silver and gold, but she gave all of my gifts to him. Counterfeit God. There's this, this oppressive doctrine or theology that we actually live in fear when it comes to God and our relationship. For example, if I don't tithe and give offerings today, then this next week I'm going to get a flat tire. You know, I'm going to, my bank account's going to get hacked, or something bad's going to happen to me because I didn't give an offering. But see, Scripture says that we're supposed to know before we enter this place what we're going to give to God, and that God wants the heart of a cheerful giver. He doesn't want a heart of someone under fear. Like, oh my gosh, something bad's going to happen. That's what I'm going to give. I don't want my kids to walk in the house after school and think that they have to give their dad a hug because if they don't, then I'm not going to feed them today. I want my kids to walk the door and love me because I'm their dad and I love them. And the same is with God. See, we put these, this legalism, this religious spirit when we embrace this counterfeit God when it comes to walking with him. However, there are things that happen in our life that are like the thorn bushes in the walls that Hosea writes about. See, God does put things up in our life to prevent us from stepping off the edge. He does these things out of love, and sometimes we shake our fists and say, God, why did you do this to me? And what he's saying is, stop chasing the counterfeit gods and come back to me, and everything you're looking for, I promise I will provide to you. We need to examine ourselves and say, man, am I chasing after anything other than God? Am I looking at anything else for security? Is my 401 or my retirement plan, is my pension, are these the things that are going to give me security? It, it, is this what I'm, I'm trusting in? Or am I trusting in God? Am I looking at my house to provide safe place for my family? Or am I looking to God? I mean, these things... These, these things that we put on here, they can be good things, but they were never meant to be the ultimate things.
But we've placed them on the throne where they were never meant to be or intended to be. That's for God and God alone. And he puts up thorn bushes and walls. Sometimes life gets hard. And the reason why is because God says he disciplines those that he loves. And Paul says that we should never run away from the discipline. We should welcome it. Because that means God loves us. You know, I was sharing this in my car one day with my kids. And because Sophia, she'll tell you that she's my favorite. I won't tell you if she is or isn't because Mariah's here. But so I was telling my kids, I said, kids, God disciplines them. Because they, they asked, why, Dad, why do you discipline us? And I said, because God disciplines those he loves. And when we discipline you, it means that we love you. We want you to walk the right path, not the wrong one. And it's not out of a dictatorship part. It's because I love you. And so Josh from the back of the van said, man, I must be your favorite because you discipline me all the time. You know? <laughs> sometimes we're like my Josh. We're a little thick-headed. And it's inherited from me. I know where he got it from, but we don't always learn the first time. And therefore, God disciplines us a little longer, a little harder, maybe a little more firm. But the reason why he disciplines is because he doesn't want you to change that for these counterfeit gods. These counterfeit gods cannot save you. These counterfeit gods cannot give you forgiveness of your sins like Jesus did. These counterfeit gods cannot meet your daily needs. They will not provide your daily bread. These counterfeit gods never promised you because they're dead. They can't fulfill any promises. We need to stop putting things on this throne and just, God, it's all yours. Didn't Jesus pay the debt? Didn't he die for our sins? Didn't he die so that we could have a relationship with God? He never died for a religion. He died, John 17, 3, that we may know him. I believe it's Isaiah, he writes, that there is coming a time when we will no longer call God, God, but we will call him our husband. Think of that. He's still God, but that's the relationship he wants us to have as a husband and a wife are supposed to have. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he says, my name is jealous and I am a jealous God. He's jealous for you. He doesn't want to see anything else up there but him. And he'll do whatever it takes to get him back on that throne because he loves you and cares for you that much.
that that is why he sent his son. Isaiah says it pleased God to crush his son. It pleased God to have his son die for you because he loves you that much. That's how valuable you are to God. You are worth just as much as his son Jesus Christ to him. Because God doesn't make bad trades or bad investments. He knows who you are and he loves you. So if you're in this place this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, don't walk out of here without handing it over to him. Because like the prodigal son, he will brush you off. He will put new clothes on your body, your shoes on your feet. He places a ring on your finger which symbolizes that you are part of his family. He belongs to you and you belong to him. And he throws a feast, a, a celebration. The angels, bigger than any party anyone's ever seen. Yes. The moment that you say, God, forgive me. There's no scolding. There's no I told you so. There's just forgiveness. Jesus said, I forgive you for your sins. Get up. Let's go sin no more. And it's only by falling in love with God and placing him back on that throne can we live a life it's worthy of Him. So if you're in this place this morning and you've never given your life to Christ, then come on up to the altar this morning. We'll pray together. Let God adopt you into His family. And oh, what a, what a day it'll be. Just give the, just give the junk to God. If you're in this place and you know that you've got false idols, we all do. We all have counterfeit gods. We even here today say, God, pray just like David did. God, search me. Search my heart. Search all the secret places, God. And if there's anything, any iniquity, anything that's, any counterfeit gods in my life, Lord, this week, expose them so we can identify them, expose them, and destroy them. So, God, search me this week. Because we all have counterfeit gods and we all need to get rid of them. God has something so marvelous for you. But as long as he's not on that throne, it can't happen. He's got plans. As my sister Tammy said earlier, he's got a destiny for you. You're called to do greater things than even Jesus did. Let that sink in for a moment. But it's not until we get rid of the counterfeit gods and place God back on the throne and these things happen and come to fruition. So, Father, search us this week. Expose, identify, expose, and we will destroy through the power of the Holy Spirit these counterfeit gods. We will live a life sold out for you madly in love for you, with you, searching only for you. Father, bless your children this morning as we, we leave some praises to you. For we were created by you, for you, to worship only you. May your name be praised this week, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.